that some of you sent in. At the end, if any of you have questions, Kathy will take those questions. So to get us started off, I have three questions that were sent in and they're all pertaining to basically the same thing. So I'm gonna read all three of them. It says, if the appliances belong to the resident and there is a deficiency, would the owner agent still be responsible to correct deficiency? Also, will the inspector hold the owner responsible for a resident's damaged personal property, such as a cracked photo glass with a cracked hmm. mirror hanging on the wall? Why did I get cited for a resident's glass fish tank being cracked? And how can I fix that deficiency without buying the resident a new fish tank? Kathy, what do you have to say about that one? I've got, I always have a lot to say, okay? <laughs> you can't get me to stop talking react 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, so first, let me tell you about what the compilation bulletin says. It states that refrigerators, stoves, and window air conditioners that are owned by the resident must be inspected and deficiencies recorded, you know, period. You can absolutely appeal those deficiencies under ownership issues to HUD. So I, I get that a lot on my REAC inspections where I go into somebody's personal fridge and they're like, well, why are you looking at that? That's mine because I have to, as far as resident owned appliances. I got a circle over here. <laughs> All other resident owned property will be inspected for health and safety defects only and recorded under health and safety hazards other. And that's our non-scoring section. Okay, that's where things are not worth points. So if you have tenant owned fire extinguishers, mirrors that are broken, picture frames that are broken, fan covers that are missing the fan cover, play equipment that's broken, all of that is health and safety hazards other. So to answer the question on the fish tank, I don't know where they would have written it. If they wrote it under sharp edges, that's absolutely against protocol. It's in the comp bulletin that it should be listed as health and safety hazards other, okay? Not sharp edges. That changed. I think even before 2017, I've been doing this since 2007, but that's been, this has been the status quo for a long time. The fire okay. extinguishers one, uh, that took us 16 years to get HUD to make not a scoring deficiency. So those are items you can appeal or you should appeal. Any, well, a lot of these are lower points. Like for instance, a refrigerator gasket is 0 0.2 rough, roughly. So if you're at an 89.9, and that's what you have to appeal, for God's sakes, appeal it. That, that'll give you an extra year before you're, you have another REAC inspection, you know? But look at the scoring value on it, and if it's worth it to you, if it's gonna bump you up a year, then yeah, absolutely, you know, appeal. And you based on ownership issues. So usually people will have it in their lease. We do not provide refrigerators. We do not provide stoves, et cetera. And then you just send in a copy of your lease with your appeal and say, look, you know, we don't provide them. And a, and a note from the tenant saying, this is mine, not yours. My problem. And Kathy, I think this would be a great time for you to tell us about Inspire, because that's something that everybody wants to know. Where are we with that? How long will we keep our regular REACT inspections? And when will we convert over? Can you give us any insight on that? Yeah, actually, we have a couple of Inspire questions in this list. Um, many of you are aware that HUD just filed for an extension, which we all knew was coming. So now we're looking at the demo going all the way through 2023. And honestly, most of us still think it's going to be longer than that. Um, almost every program historically that HUD or the government in general has put out, it has taken a long time to roll out. And this is huge. This is a complete revamping of the entire inspection process. So they really need to make sure that everything's going to work. And uh, they got a long way to go. So we're at least till 2023, if not longer. And I've got a couple slides a little bit later on some of the Inspire questions that came up. Great, thank you. So that means that your session today is gonna to be very beneficial because we don't even need to think about Inspire for another two to five years, it kind of sounds like. You so, know what, and that's almost a mantra that most of the consultants have been telling people, quit looking at the Inspire standards, quit doing it. Because if you start 
looking at that, you're going to get confused with what, what is now, what is REAC, and not to mention all of those standards, all of those deficiencies, they're going to get revamped. They're going to get changed. They already have once. And in fact, I, I got some insider knowledge that they're already working on version three. So we've had 1.3 and now 2.1, and they're working on version three of the standards right now, which is, again, going to change what currently is there. So don't put a whole, don't budget. Don't put a lot of stock in it. I saw some scary emails going around saying everybody needs to get a fire extinguisher because, you know, you have to start budgeting because all your units will need fire extinguishers. Okay, that was in 1.3. They changed that in 2.1. So when the new standards came up, they said, no, only if there's evidence that a fire extinguisher used to be there is where you provide them to the residents. Meanwhile, I'm sure there's a quite a few properties out there that freaked out and went out and bought everybody a fire extinguisher. And now with their reacts, they're going to have to make sure that the gauge is in the green, the tag is certified, um, if, it's, if, it's rechar if it's rechargeable, if it's disposable, that they get rid of it. If it goes into the red, then you've got missing fire extinguishers. They got a whole host of problems now by providing that. So that opened up Pandora's box. Oh, yes. So please, 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 please don't do anything under Inspire until it becomes law. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, question says, are points deducted if the stove light stays on, even if the stove top or oven is not being used or not on? Okay, when I saw this question, um, sorry about the background noise, there's always somebody with a blower, you know? I mean, really. Okay, so no, <laughs> when I saw this question, I what I'm thinking they're talking about here is not the appliance light. They're talking about the safety light, and I've had that before. And what I usually do during my inspections is I'll say, hey, everything's off. And I play with all the knobs and make sure everything's off. And the, if the light's still on, indicating that a burner's on or the oven's on, that's the safety light. And I'll let the management know, hey, look, your safety light's always on, which is a bad thing because, God forbid, the tenant actually does leave a burner on. They're not going to know because the light's always on. So I was talking to a few other inspectors and they were saying, oh, well, we'd write it as oven and op or a level three burners inoperable. And I, I've always disagreed with that because that's called making things fit. The burners work. The oven works. You can't just throw a deficiency in because you don't like something. OK, I mean, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't get recorded or it gets recorded where HUD wants it, which is health and safety hazards other non-scoring it'll be on the report for you to see oh look the safety light on the oven's on that's where you record things that don't fit our definition okay. and, and our protocol okay so in health and safety am i to understand that with health and safety other you have a zero point deduction correct that's where we put everything that doesn't fit so if you have rebar sticking up and that's an impaling hazard health and safety hazards other a whole list of health and safety has their others. <laughs> well, I hope everybody else is learning something because I'm learning something new and I did react inspections, but I must have forgotten about that one. Yeah, uh, that's that's our non-scoring section. I used to, before pot was legal in California, I used to have people ask me to write up when I found marijuana in the units. And that's where I put it, health and safety hazards other. Now that it's legal, but there's still HUD properties. That's that's the caveat. You know, it may be legal statewide, but Federally, it's not. No. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Uh, <laughs> question number three is one of those INSPIRE questions. It said protocols will change the findings for pest infestation. The new protocol would not result in a finding if infestation from the presence of traps, but pest droppings would be a finding. Bed bug droppings typically are indicated by staining of the mattress or bedding due to fecal matter. These droppings cannot be cleaned from a mattress or other upholstery surfaces. Will bed bug fecal stains or staining count as pest infestation? So All right. We're talking about INSPIRE, but what are we under, under REACT? Well, they're saying Inspire protocols will change the findings. Now, there, I need to clarify something on that, okay? And I've got slides for this. Okay. 
first of all, again, don't start to prepare for Inspire, even if you're all part of the demo, because all the protocols are continually changing. Okay, the infestation standard is a perfect example of you know all the things that are broken right now with Inspire. Look at this definition. It's the presence of potentially disease carrying animals or insects. And then it goes on to list all different types of animals and insects that have not been proven to ever carry disease causing pathogens. Okay, so bees, wasps, bed bugs, spiders, gophers, okay, they do not spread disease. And this is from the CDC and experts. Trust me, I looked all this up when I first saw this. If they want to keep these examples in this definition, it needs to be amended to say something like the presence of animals or insects that could cause bodily harm or be potentially disease carrying. Uh, although even with that definition, I think gophers still, they're not going to fit. <laughs> okay, I don't know why they listed gophers. And then, so back to your question, you stated that the new Inspire protocol will not result in a finding of infestation from the presence of traps, but droppings would be a finding. First, this is not a change from what is now with React currently, okay? I do want to add, though, that under Inspire, under insects, there's virtually no mention yet about any sticky traps or bait, and that's just for insects, okay? It does mention not to record a rodent trap as long as there's no rodent in it, but look what React says right now, okay? So this is under Inspire, okay, first. This says evidence of cockroaches, and you can see presence of dead or live, shed skins, droppings, egg cases, but there's nowhere in the protocol that it says anything about bait, traps, or other, okay? Here is what it says under React for insects. You see evidence of infestation of insects, including roaches and ants throughout a unit or room, especially in food prep and storage areas. This is important. If you see baits, traps, and sticky boards that show no presence of insects, do not record this as a deficiency. It says that right now, okay? Same with rats and mice and vermin. Same exact thing. If you see baits, traps, or sticky boards with no presence of the vermin, all right? Under REAC, one dead roach or roach droppings are recorded as health and safety hazards other, but a lot of inspectors don't know that because they'll click on health and safety, they click on infestation, and then they follow the, the decision tree is what we call it. So it'll say one dead roach or roach droppings. Okay, I select that and they'll say, okay, well, I just recorded a health and safety, but they don't see the final is health and safety hazards other. There's no point value on that at all for one dead roach or roach droppings. Now, one live roach or multiple dead are absolutely worth point, okay? And I'm gonna talk about bed bugs on this next slide, but your biggest takeaway from this slide is do not focus on Inspire deficiencies yet because HUD just filed an extension to 2023 and they'll probably file another one. Okay, let me just jump in there and say that with our resident complaints that we get as a contract administrator, we have a lot of people who call to um, say that their units are infested. So based on what you told us, and then you told me something the other day about a dead roach that I did not know. Oh, yes. You just told us. Uh, infestation is when there's more than one or two and they're just crawling everywhere, all up the wall, all inside the refrigerator. I mean, all in the areas where it's supposed to be sanitary for cooking or whatever have you. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of pictures that we just received where apparently they were coming in through the dryer vent, the rodents were, the little mice and whatever have you. So that would be considered infestation when you have more than one. You're right, one, one live or multiple dead. Okay, so can you tell everybody the definition or what you told me about a dead roach the other day? Oh yeah, um, you guys can Google this too, but the reason why this is the only dead bug that we write up is because up to two weeks after death, the roaches can still have their babies, even if they're squished they can still hatch their babies, okay? And here's another thing that's messed up with Inspire right now. 
they have multiple different, this is just one, evidence of cockroaches. They also have evidence of extensive cockroach infestation. That is by some miracle supposed to be a 24-hour fix. Okay. 24 hours for an extensive cockroach infestation. Their definition of extensive is also a little bit messed up because first they say more than three, three roaches is considered extensive. Can you imagine as a manager, as maintenance, trying to get the tenant on board to clean everything up, move everything around, get pest control in there within 24 hours? You can't kill roaches in 24 hours. You gotta remove, I Googled this, I made sure. There, there's virtually no way you can get rid of an infestation in 24 hours. You gotta remove every single dead body. And if you miss one, which you will, because they're in the walls, they're in the back of the cabinets in the corners, you know, things like that. The cycle starts all over again. So like I said, Inspire's changing, but HUD needs your feedback. You've got to let them know, hey, look, this is not reasonable. 24-hour fix is, is impossible for an extensive cockroach infestation. And if you notice under their definition, I did say over three, but the next part of the definition is, but if you see one in multiple rooms. So you could have two. Say I see one in the kitchen and one in the bathroom. That can be considered extensive as well under the current definition, even though it's not three. So it's confusing, you know, and hopefully HUD's going to clarify some of that in version three. But let me show you some photos here. This is the roach droppings that they're talking about. Roaches and electricity go together like peanut butter and jelly. Okay, they love it. And I don't know if it's the heat or the vibration or both. You actually see them sticking out of the ground right here too. Uh, both of them, both of them. Yeah, they're coming out. So that's extensive. Oh my. Yeah, everybody loves good roach pictures, right? You'll find them on top of refrigerators, inside cabinets. There's some key places we'll always look, you know, especially under the kitchen sink, on top of the refrig refrigerator. Those are bed bugs. Now, that's the bed bug part of this question I wanted to address. We used to pick alternate units if you had bed bug infestations, but that changed in 2016. Now, we don't purposely seek them out, but if the software picks it, a uh, sample unit, say unit 402, and that has bed bugs, we have to go in, all right? If you guys refuse to go in, we can give you a zero for your inspection. We can say it, we can upload it as unsuccessful. Yes. Okay. You have, you have to go in with us. We cannot pick an alternate because you're not comfortable or whatever. And HUD made that absolutely clear. It's in writing that we can upload it as unsuccessful if you refuse to go in. Now, here, this is important because it was one of the questions here. Bed bugs are not scored. They're not worth points. The only time we even record them is if we physically see them, which is very hard to do. Okay, this is a blown up Im image. And honestly, these are relatively big, but you'll see the debris. And if the inspector wants to put it as just a straight health and safety hazards, other they can. But if we see a live bed bug by some chance, if they follow the correct decision tree, it will still lead them to health and safety hazards other, not worth points. There was an inspector notice 2016-01. It says right on there, even if inspectors write these up, they will not be scored. So, but you got to follow the correct decision tree, and that's really easy for inspectors to mess up. It really is. Oh, Excuse me. Yeah. Okay, so you said that when they pick a unit, it does. they can pick a bed bug unit. That's what it's, you say? No, that's it's, not it's, what, it's, what I said yeah, was. Repeat, yeah, repeat it. Repeat again, please. I'm sorry. Not a problem. Not a problem. Okay. So what I said is when we get on site, we hit a button, generate sample on our computer, and it spits out all the unit numbers that we're going to do. And we've already Stop assigned. Right your Stop right there. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is they don't choose the units. When they get on site, the computer chooses the unit, and they can't pre-push that button before they get on site. They have to wait till they get to the property to push the button, because yeah. a lot of people will say, well, they always pick my unit. They're not picking your unit. The computer picks your unit. Now, go ahead. Bingo. Bingo. And if one of those units selected happen to have bed bugs, then we go in. 
So it's not like I'm seeking it out. You know, I had a manager once say, my unit gets selected every year. You always pick it. I don't. The software does, you know, and you'll find that historically there will be a couple units that are literally always selected, you know, because that's how, what the software randomly generates. Random, it, it's not that random. <laughs> it really Some isn't. of you managers might remember at one time when HUD had told the REACT inspectors that if there was a bed bug unit, they did not have to go in that unit. So if the machine had picked that unit, they could skip that unit and choose an alternate unit. But what she's telling us is that when the notice came out again, it said regardless, if the software chooses the bed bug unit, that the inspector still has to go in. And what she's telling us is that someone from management has to go in with them. And if yes. they don't go in with them, you get a zero on your total react inspection. Yeah, uh, HUD's not playing with that. They, we had a conference call. They had experts on the phone trying to alleviate fears that the inspect a lot of inspectors, they don't want to go in, you know, but roaches, I'm sorry, bed bugs are kind of the fear of the year. Roaches mm -hmm. are way worse. Roaches carry up to 30 human diseases. Bed bugs just bite. Bed bugs are not known to carry any disease carrying pathogens whatsoever. Roaches are the leading cause of asthma. And they track just as easily as bed bugs do. So I knew it was coming. I didn't care. You know, they, they want me in there. They want me out. As far as I'm concerned, I'd rather pick alternates for roach units, <laughs> personally. Now, but so what if so what if the, oh so what if the resident just refused to let you in? Will will they affect our react score? If the resident refuses us to go in, then we pick an alternate. But, I mean, you really don't want to coach them to do something no. like that no. because that's kind of gaming the system. Um, but we don't get into arguments or fights with the resident. They, they say no, we pick an alternate unit, and then you as management will take the appropriate lease violation actions because they didn't allow their unit to be inspected. I say that because I have the older people, and sometimes it's a tug of war even there. Yeah. yeah, something to tell your residents is we're here for them. We're not here to nitpick and pick them apart or tell them how to live. One of my trainers in my early years, he said it best. He said, Kathy, you're not here to tell a tenant how to live. You're here to make sure what's there works and that they're getting being taken care of, you know, and that has helped me throughout my career because there will be certain times where a tenant will say, take off their their um, toilet handle because they have severe arthritis. So they put a ribbon on it instead. They can grab the ribbon, but pushing the handle hurts. I'm not going to write them up for an NIS because as far as I'm concerned, that's a reasonable accommodation. As long as I see that they still have the parts and they're not damaged. Okay. So I'm not there to say you have to flush that toilet with your hand and, and have massive amounts of pain. That's not my job. Mm -mm. I'm there to make sure if I pull that ribbon, the toilet's going to flush just fine too, you know? Now, uh, Kathy, the question that I had that you had told us that with Inspire, they were doing, as, as far as the roaches go, pest control coming out 24 hours, it's proposed. <laughs> Is there a time limit presently with REAC? No. Infestation. No. Right now with REAC, um, infestation is considered a regular health and safety. You have until next inspection to get it fixed. Okay. And, if, and if not, we'll just write you up for it again. Okay. So and there's no, and you don't have to report on it or anything like that. So the managers, don't wait till the next time. Get rid of the infestation. Yeah. It, would, it would behoove you to. Because once the residents call in complaining and HUD gets involved, then they get us involved and we have to find out when did you send pest control? How often is pest control coming? And you have to um, show us that you have scheduled maintenance in terms of pest. Um, so the next question. That was oh, well. Question. This is my last photo. I didn't say um, really fast. Always look on your water heaters, folks, for rodent droppings. That's all we need to see for an infestation, scored a scored infestation hit. We don't need to see the mouse. We don't need to see the rat. We just see their droppings. So clean up the poop. We have a question from Noreen. Yep. Um, how would you check for bed bugs in a unit? In a unit, if the bed is made, how would you see the bed bugs? 
Um, we don't. We don't. No. I don't crawl on beds. Um, a long time ago, I, <laughs> I was trying to reach the window, and I saw a bunch of, um, you know, bedding just in a big lump. And that's all I thought it was. And when I put my knee on it, I hear this oomph. Oh, God. So it turned out there's a 14 year old boy who spent the rest of the day walking around going, she climbed on top of me. I'm like, oh, never again. So <laughs> we, we don't crawl on beds. We don't inspect the beds. If you report to us, we'll ask him at the beginning of the day, do you have any bed bug units? Yes. All right. So we take the whole list down. We already know. Um, we are not pest control. We're not, we're not looking at beds. No. Now, there's only one time I've actually seen a bed bug and we, we, we didn't even go into the unit yet. We were in the hallway and I saw them on the curtains. Oh, wow. Yeah. Before, we, before even walking into the unit, I, I looked and I did a double take. I'm like, is that a bed bug? And the man's like, uh, yeah, we're skipping this unit. This is before 2016. So this is when we actually did pick an alternate. He goes, those are bed bugs. I've had residents meet me at the door with a jar of them going, are these bed bugs? <laughs> you know, no, of, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, none of the people who are on now, I, I don't think are guilty of this, but we have had in the last two months, we have had about four reports of rodents. Now, there's some things I can take, and there's some things I can't take. I can take a snake because I feel like I can outrun it, but I can't <laughs> or a mouse. I just, I just can't. The thing that I've tried to get the managers to understand about the infestation is that rats bite, and if you have and they spread disease, the unit, they will bite the children. And if you have a baby in the unit, they will smell the milk on the baby and that will make them go at the baby. So it's a huge liability for a management company not to try to treat the infestation of rodents, especially a huge liability. Okay, we have a question from Dee Dumas and she, uh, he or she wanted you to repeat, Can how long do you have to cure an infestation? Right now, it's a, considered a regular health and safety, so you have until next inspection to get it done. It's not anything you have to report on. And like I said, if you end up not taking care of the regular health and safeties, all of them, you know, whether it be mold, infestation, um, trip hazards, we'll just write them up the next year. So you technically don't have any guideline as to when you need to fix regular health and safeties. Then we have something called exigent health and safeties or criticals. These are 24-hour repairs. And if you're public housing, you have 24 hours to report to, to HUD that it's been fixed. If you're multifamily, you have three business days to let the local HUD office know it's been taken care of. So. Keep in mind, uh, managers, that even though REACT does not care, HUD does. And that infestation could be a liability to you. So we'll move on to our next question. Um, Residents tie up their call for aid pool cords, and although we make sure they're not tied up prior to a REACT inspection, we can't check them all every day. What do we do about this on an ongoing basis? This is one of my favorite subjects, hands down, okay, because I, I feel very, very strongly when these are tied up, these are a huge liability. Okay, we were talking about liability before. Here you go, big time. This cord's tied up. This one is accessible from the bed, which is not technically in writing, but I actually sent this photo over to a QA once and I said, look, it's not baseboard height, which is the requirement, but the, the tenant is bedridden and that, that's how they pull the cord. And he said that they had just had a QA meeting and they were, they had, it's going to be in the next compilation bulletin, but if it's accessible from the bed or baseboard height, you're fine. All right. Now that being said, to answer your question, this is your new best friend. This is an eyelet, eye screw, screw eye, however you want to call it. Okay. I had a tenant once spend most of her time in a recliner. The, they, what they did was they flipped the call for aid upside down. They took the string up to the ceiling over and dropped it near her hand. So I pulled the string near her hand. It absolutely worked. Okay. And you know how tenants like to hide their call for aid with dressers, right? The eyelet, the eye screw, 
you take the string to a 45 degree angle. I don't know if you could see this wall behind me. Yeah. All right. So say you have the call for aids here and it's blocked. You take it on a 45 degree angle. You put in the eye screw right there and you let it drop. If you have a cat, you put another eye screw at the bottom near the baseboard so the kitty can play but can't get a good yank. And not to mention the, the second benefit of the eye screw is that most, not all, but most tenants, once you put hardware in, they're less apt to mess with it, okay? They're not gonna tie it because now it's not messing with the toilet paper. You moved it off to 45 degrees to the side and you anchored it to the wall. Tenant can still access it, it's not gonna mess with them. Don't let it pool on the floor, okay? First of all, for OSHA, technically that's a trip hazard. And secondly, it really bugs the residents because they go to vacuum and they vacuum up the string, right? It needs to be baseboard height, plus or minus an inch or two. I just got that from a dine and learn conference call we had on with HUD. I, I was so happy when they said an inch or two of baseboard height is fine. Yes, we got that verbally recorded. So um, with Inspire, they're talking about making it six inches. Why they couldn't have just said six inches for React, I don't know. But they said baseboard height. Some people have huge baseboards. Some people have little itty bitty baseboards. <laughs> Just go baseboard height and you'll be fine, okay? Oh, and do you need to lengthen the cord? Check this one out. So they put an eye screw here and here, technically not baseboard height. I did tell them, you know, good effort, okay? I, I actually cut them a break on this one because I'm like, look, it's for me, that's close enough. I mean, come on, it used to be reachable from the floor. They're good enough. I did tell them the length of the little, they said no problem. So they, when they increase the length of their string, they put on what's called a condenser. It looks like this. This is so they don't have to restring the box, which is tough sometimes, you know, getting, you gotta get that string right into the little tiny hole. You gotta take it, the whole thing apart, the whole nine yards. It looks like this when you open it and you get it from fixmyblinds.com. And no, I don't get a kickback or anything, but I just thought that this was an absolute genius idea by this maintenance guy. I yanked, I tugged, it, it stays shut. And it, that's how you increase your length of the string if need be, without having to restring the whole thing. Oh, that, sorry, what was that? That one is the right length from the baseboard. Um, one of the main things to keep in mind for those who have senior properties is that you don't want a senior to fall or not be able to call for assistance. And that's the purpose of the call for a button. So if you have one of the light up boards, make sure that the lights in the board work. Check those periodically. So now how many points are they worth, Kathy? 0 0.1 Zero. per unit. So say you've got one in the bathroom, one in the living room, and one in the bedroom, and all three are either tied up, blocked, or don't notify somebody. It's only 0 0.1 once per unit. And so, you know, the other part of her question was basically, how do we hold these tenants accountable? You know, we can't babysit them all the time, right? This is what you do. You know, your lease is already this thick. What's one more sheet of paper, right? One more addendum. I will not block or tie up my pull cord. Signed, dated. There was a case here in California where a resident kept blocking his cord even after he'd been verbally told again and again and again. He had a heart attack and it, the way he died, it looked like he was reaching for his cord, which was blocked by his own personal dresser. The family sued him won because he was never told in writing that he should not block it up. Common sense has no place in the courtroom, people. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. So what's one more sheet of paper? Talk to your legal department and say, hey, can we put in one more addendum? I will not block or tie up my pull cord. If legal says you're good with it, please do it. And get a witness, like a family member or something saying, yes, you know, they signed this. Um, and hold them accountable. That was gonna be my second point. It might not be worth a whole lot of points off of your score, but what it will do to your property in terms of lawsuits is just outrageous. Yes, it's huge, huge. The next question, we don't have any from you, do we, Ebony? Okay, the next question, would the property be held responsible for damages to storm drains that are located on the property, but owned by the city? What if the necessary repairs are not 
remediated before the REACT inspection. Would that be a binding to the property? Um, first of all, you might be surprised um, what's your responsibility and what isn't. Look up your jurisdiction, get it in writing. If the city says that that is their storm drain and they are solely responsible for any and all repairs to it, get it in writing. You're going to need it for an appeal, okay? Because just like with fencing, the inspectors aren't going to determine ownership on something like that. We're going to write it up. You appeal. The onus is on you to say, hey, this isn't my problem. It's the city's problem, okay? Um, so let me see if I answered all that part of the question. If the repairs are not remediated prior to the REACT inspection, yeah, it'll be written up. It'll be written up. But again, you could always appeal based on ownership issues. It's not mine. But I was doing a Google search when that first, uh, the question first came in and, and I thought about it and I said, I wonder how many people, because nobody's ever asked me that in 14 years, so good job. <laughs> I, I, I get asked so many questions. That's one I wasn't asked before because it never came up. I see a partially or fully blocked storm drain. I write it up, I move on and nobody's ever said, that's not my storm drain unless I was actually in the city street. And then it clearly is not their storm drain. And by the comp bulletin, we don't write that up. Okay. But if it's on your property, usually it's your responsibility to fix it. So definitely double check with your authority having jurisdiction on that. Well, the person that wrote this one sent me a picture, I guess about a year ago. And you know how you have a concrete slab across the drain? A lot of times the kids will walk on it, step on it, hop off of it, da, da, da. The concrete slab was missing. Okay. I would have to see a picture on that. Something had broken it and it had broken in half. And so there was not a cover over the drain at all. And uh, there again, as I told her, I would worry about the liabilities before I worry about the repairs. Because sometimes repairs are, are a little nothing in terms of money. Sometimes the liability in court is just, you know, it just never ends. Yeah, and that's another confusion that you know the inspectors have had over the years because in our software it says the drain's partially clogged or fully clogged. It doesn't say anything about damage, missing, blah blah blah, but the federal register does. So if the if the grater grill is missing or the slab covering it is missing, they could write it up and they could make that fit and we could not appeal that off because it does match the federal register. Well, we could try. Um, because, but proving what the software shows is tough because there's no, there's no, um, it's, it's not available. They don't have an Excel spreadsheet of this is everything you see in the software and versus this is what we see in the federal register. We could take the report and show it that way. Um, but it's a 50, 50 chance because with the federal register saying storm drains missing slash damage slash clogged, you know, it all applies. Okay. The next one says, why is the property penalized for items found on a shared fence gate, such as the other person's trees hanging over the property's side or a tree or a branch touching the roof of the property? Okay, this is what the comp bulletin right? This is what the comp bulletin says, okay? If a property has fencing along its perimeter acting as a security safety fence four feet in height or more, whether it's owned by the property or not, the fencing must be inspected for deficiencies. This doesn't apply to non-security, non-safety, which is less than four feet high. Now, to answer your first part of your question, why? Because for years, if you said that's not my fence, we'd be like, okay, and we just keep walking. Unfortunately, it only takes a couple of bad eggs to ruin it for everybody else. So a couple of people were lying, and it was their fence. So HUD said, you know what, you're done. We're gonna take the guesswork out of this for you. Whether it's owned by the property or not, you're writing it up. Then the, the property, if it truly is not their fence, they can appeal based on ownership issues. They'll have to get the owner to put in writing that this is mine, not yours. Now, that, the second part of your question, say you have vegetation coming through like this. This is actually um, city, believe it or not. This is city owned property over here and this is the HUD property over here. Once that vegetation crosses that fence line, it's your problem, okay? You are 
covered by the law to cut down everything on your side of the fence. Now, if you live in California, there's one more caveat. If you cut any tree branches down that are not your tree, you have to return the branches to the owner of the tree. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. It's only in California. I found this out because my neighbor decided that my 40 foot pine tree was in his line of sight. So he chopped it down on my property. He went on my property and cut down my tree. Yeah, yeah I know. What you do with the parts that he bought back to you? He didn't bring it. We actually caught him when he was half done killing my tree. And uh, we're like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is 10 feet in on our property line. And he, he didn't see that. He's like, oh, I, I didn't know where the property markers were. And whatever. It was in his way. He was lying. So is that the same thing as the um, person asking the question, talking about when the tree branch from another property reaches because you know in Alabama I don't know where all of you are but in Alabama we have some big trees and yeah just just stretch over and over so what are they responsible for those overhanging uh my insurance man told me it's airspace so it's yeah. my airspace I can cut anything that's in my airspace that's yeah on your property line yeah absolutely now if it's touching your building or anything unintentional and this is important for penetrating vegetation the deficiency it's any unintentional contact contact with something whether it be electrical wires or roof gutters um, anything that is not intended to be grown upon. Now, I got to say that over and over again, because some people intentionally grow vegetation on their signage because it's a, a graffiti deterrent. It's a great idea. The second part of that definition is it must be maintained. So you can't just say, oh, we're trying to grow that there. If it looks all kinds of messed up like this picture, you know, you, you got th things growing out. All, it doesn't look maintained. It's not clean. We can write you up for that, too. So if you're going to grow jasmine all over your retaining wall, great. I love the smell of jasmine. But make sure it looks maintained, not scraggly and unkempt. You know what I mean? Um, hmm? I say, yeah, I do. Sorry, and let me know if I don't fully answer your question, please let me know in chat and just add it. Oh, we're going to get there. I see that question. Okay. I've got it. I got a slide on that. Okay, why is the property penalized for potholes, etc., that are on the city street? Okay, <clears throat> this is what the compilation bulletin wrote roadways and walkways that the property represents as owned by a public authority like city, county, or state are not to be inspected. The exemption is for health and safety deficiencies that impact or affect the resident and should be recorded as health and safety hazards other not worth points because it's not your property. So unlike fencing, whether we don't care if you own it or not, we're going to write it up. You can tell us, hey, that's not my street. This pothole is not mine. And I have to believe you, okay? When, unless you're wishy-washy and I don't believe you. You got to be assertive. You know, you can't be like, well, I think my property line ends right here, but I'm not quite sure. Well, if you're not sure, I'm writing it up as a tripping hazard, okay? Be sure. This is my line right here. If you look over here, see this curb? That's where it ended. This is city. Now, that being said, I recently had a situation with a property where the inspector followed the, followed the protocol and on the, they had wrought iron security fencing around their perimeter of their property. Outside that fencing perimeter, there was a trip hazard on the sidewalk. I mean, it's a city, right? City side, a big city, I think it was Oakland huge trip hazard. So he wrote it under health and safety hazards other. HUD held the inspection, emailed the inspector and said, did you put it there on mis by mistake? And he goes, and he, he reached out to me and I said, you tell them what page in the comp bulletin it says to write it as health and safety hazards other. So then HUD writes back and says, yeah, we know the comp bulletin says that and, and thank you for following protocol, but how did you know that it was a city street? or a city sidewalk. And he goes, because the property told me and I believe them. And so then they, they were still holding on to the score and they went to the property and said, we need proof that that is owned by the city. I know, right? I saw somebody go, oh, wow. I'm like, yeah. 
I was not, I was furious about this, that they put the property, you try to get the city to put in writing that their damaged stuff is theirs. You know, it's, it's almost impossible. I don't know about the cities that they live in, but I know about the city that I live in. Oh, we finally got the score released, but that it's being not on property. If it's oh, I'm not sorry. in the driveway, if it's not on the property and the tenants don't get a chance to find it or break an axle or anything like that. Okay. Number 10 says, can you define what materials can be applied to fill, patch, or repair holes, gaps, etc., to comply with REACT protocols for concrete? brick and mortar. Yes, I can, because HUD did. HUD actually put this in writing. This is from HUD, copy and pasted, okay? They said, in addition to tuck pointing, the use of newer products designed specifically for repairing concrete cracks is also acceptable. These must be made in a professional manner and the repair shall not be easily distinguishable. The use of interior exterior painters caulking is not acceptable. They allow you to use polyurethane mortar joint sealant. The whole key word here, two words, is industry standard. You have a crack in the brick, you have a crack in the concrete, you need to use the industry standard product to repair that so that it'll pass REAC, okay? You can't just put interior painters caulking on a concrete crack and say, oh, I fixed it. You know, th that's not acceptable. It's, it's not gonna last. You know, you need to put in a concrete sealant if it's wide enough to be sealed. So hopefully that answers your question. This is straight from them. And it's anything that's an industry standard accepted repair for whatever is broken, whether it be brick, concrete, mortar, you know, whatever. Okay, thank you. And that kind of like uh, leads to the next question. Are there specific requirements for repairing or replacing vinyl or wood siding that is damaged? Like that? <laughs> yeah, like that. yeah. Well, let me talk a little more about NIS. This is from the compilation bulletin. This is also from HUD. All repairs shall be made in a good and workmanlike manner with suitable materials, blend into the surrounding area, and be free from defects. Each repair must be made in, accord in accordance with the industry standard for that particular inspectable item. So that being said, putting up some sheet metal or plywood over all this dry rot rotted siding not an acceptable repair. Okay, and I have seen that done before. Maybe plywood's temporary until you can fix it. That happens, okay? There's, if you're making it better, and this is the other thing I wanted to tell you about appeals. They recently changed like two years ago. We used to um, be able to appeal all day long on things that are work in progress. Now the key word is modernization work in progress, and HUD doesn't define what exactly modernization is other than you're upgrading, you're making it better, okay? So say you're peeling off all the stucco and you're gonna put in some new hardy board. That's an upgrade. That's modernization work in progress. Not a problem, we'll get that one appealed. But just replacing the existing, that's a repair. It's not considered modernization, there is no appeal on that. So if you're working on it during the inspection, we're not gonna get the points back on it. Okay. My next question is, uh, and maybe I should save 12 for last. Hold on. Can we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we do have another question about does a defensive response from the property hurt them after a failed inspection and what steps would you advise the owner to do? Are you, by defensive response, do you mean appeal? D. Dumas? Is that what you mean? Or are you talking about the response to um, to HUD, like for the Compliance Disposition Enforcement Plan? I would kind of think that they were talking about uh, an appeal. Property uh, owner. What, what's that? Oh, no, just a defensive response is what they're clarifying to me. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll answer both questions. Okay, if we're talking about an appeal, absolutely not. There is no re negative repercussions for appealing. The inspector won't even know you appealed, okay? The inspector never knows if you appealed or what the outcome was ever. 
they're not notified, even if they're the ones in the wrong, okay? HUD encourages appeals. They have a, if you Google HUD React appeal, you'll find very first link is their page and they'll say what to say, what not to say, how to appeal, where to send it, the whole nine yards, okay? Or of course you can always get a consultant to do the appeal for you. Um, if we're talking about on a field, field inspection, if you're talking about a defensive response in a negative way, like I'm not willing to work with you and you know, HUD, you can go pound sand or something like that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. uh, what they're saying is sometimes the owner gets upset and sends defensive letter before they appeal. Nothing before you appeal, you're upset. You, you may have every reason to be upset. I, there was recently um, an inspection where the inspector was very, very unprofessional. And the property and the, um, they, they wrote letters to HUD and HUD conducted their own internal investigation. They, they take everything very seriously. They'll, they'll read everything. If you, there's defensive and then there's hostile, okay? If you are being professional and you're not being hostile, there's no, there's no neg negative repercussions to that. I mean, HUD loves communication, ultimately, okay? But, mm -hmm. I was going to say, I do have something that uh, kind of links with that. Um, what do you as inspectors think about managers who go along with you? And this is where the temperament comes in. It's when the manager is going along with the react inspector and the inspector cites something and the manager says, oh, no, that's not this, that's not that. Um, first of all, when I used to do them, I tell the managers, you know, you're supposed to be here, but any comments that you have that you want to make, you could make to me uh, at a later date because I've got a time frame to get through all of these units or whatever. Yeah. Well, um, the, my response, I love teaching and training. So when, when people try to argue with me about a deficiency, it's hilarious because I know, I, I know the protocol, I know the federal register, I, inside out and backwards, all right? Bring it on, okay? I will debate with you all day long. So I look at it as a teaching, training moment. There are some other inspectors, though, that get extremely defensive. They, I had one guy that was aware of it, and I told him, look, you know, because he was a friend of mine, I said, if any time you start feeling like you're getting attacked, call me and I'll let you know if the property is actually attacking you or not. And he did. He did multiple times. He called me up and say, the property is telling me this. And, and I said this and, and, I, and, he gets, and he's all upset and he's like ready to walk off the property. He's that upset. And I, and I said, look, calm down. They want to know. Teach them. Tell them what the protocol is. Walk them through it. And he's like, really? They're not, they're not attacking me? No. So I actually appreciated, you know, him looking for the lifeline. But that being said, there's some inspectors that are really ultra defensive and they get agitated. It's all about how you phrase the question. You know, there's some inspectors that are unfortunately extremely power happy. Okay. If you say something like, you know, Vicki, I'm sorry. I just, I really want to learn on this. I, I just don't know. And you're the expert. Can you explain to me why you're writing that up? So you, not only are you going to get your answer, you, you kissed enough, but you know, you just made that inspector feel, oh yeah, I've got the power. I'm about to tell them, you know? Now, there's one quick story I want to share. Way back when, when I first started, there was an inspector who's no longer certified. He would have people unsecure the secure disconnects, and then he would write them up for exposed wires. That has always been in the compilation, as far as I've been inspecting, that if the disconnect box is secured at the time of inspection, we do not open the box. So I started passing out the compilation like it was candy to all the properties. And this property manager, she had him on one of her sites. And when he called her out for exposed wires, she goes, um, sir, excuse me, I'm sorry, but it says right, right here on, on page, whatever it was, page 32, that if the disconnect's secure, you're not supposed to open the box. And he goes, where did you get that? And she goes, HUD.gov. <laughs> she wasn't going to throw me under the bus. Have you ever been to HUD.gov and tried to find something? Uh -huh. Yeah. Another thing that um, managers, while we're on this subject, 
I have a, and I hope uh, this particular ED from a housing authority is on with us today. Usually he does. His staff accused him of their failing the REACT inspector because he just intimidated the inspector. They said that every time the inspector would let's say go to do a lock. He'd either go behind the inspector or he'd do the lock before the inspector got to it. Sometimes as managers, we want high scores and you know we, we're trying to be proactive, but sometimes it would just behoove us to just kind of be calm, let the inspector do their job and then ask our questions. You wanna facilitate the inspection. You wanna make sure that the resident stays off of the inspector, okay? Um, keep the resident busy doing something else. You want to open up blinds. You want to just make the inspector's job as easily as humanly possible. You don't want the inspector standing around. You, you have every single key to everything. Looks like I had a question come in. Does the inspector request a copy of the notice that was given to the residents informing of the inspection? That is the absolute most important document of the day. I walk in, sit down, shake your hand. Hi, I'm Kathy, I'm your REAC inspector. Do you have the notice that you sent to the residents for the inspection? And you look at me like, oh, you needed that? You're in the headlights. And I just go, you know, face palm because I can't start the inspection. I'm gonna have to sit here twiddling my thumbs while you guys run around like chickens with their head cut off trying to find a notice to show me that the residents were actually notified. And in the meantime, I'm wasting time. I'm looking around for deficiencies. I'm thinking, you know, this is going to be an awful day. You want to, that is, you have to have that on top of your react binder. The very first sheet of paper you hand that inspector, here's the notice mm -hmm. and we can get started. All right. That's kind of the way it is with the MORs also because the uh, residents have to know you're coming into their units. Yeah. Uh, also, Kathy, this is a real quick one. Are points deducted for smoke detectors? <laughs> no points for smoke alarms or detectors. Now, if you're circling back to an initial question, this is the slide that talks about the ABC, right? Mm -hmm. So this is directly from a REAC inspection report from HUD. Okay, I cut and pasted this here. So say you get a 95C or a 67B with an asterisk, 84A with an asterisk, etc. The asterisk indicates that health and safety deficiencies were found with respect to smoke detectors. That's what the asterisk means, that you had a smoke detector recorded. That's all it means. The lowercase letter indicates whether or not different kinds of health and safety deficiencies were observed. So if you have an A, there were no health and safeties at all. If you have an A with an asterisk, there were no health and safeties, but you did have a smoke detector. If there was a B, it was regular health and safeties. B asterisk, regular health and safeties plus the smoke detector. And then C is going to be exigent health and safeties. And again, the asterisk is smoke alarm or smoke detector. It also does say here, although all health and safety deficiencies except for smoke detector problems and other hazards affect the scores with appropriate deductions, the letter grades are added to highlight the serious nature. Now, notice HUD said right here that anything written under other hazards or smoke detectors are not worth points, okay? All the other health and safeties affect the scores, except for these. So there's my, there's my proof on that. Smokes, smokes are not worth points. I heard that they used to be, but there was, um, well, first of all, HUD was getting sick of all the appeals because, again, babysitting inspector, I mean, babysitting the tenants, the tenants are always tampering with them, right? Taking the batteries out, putting them in the closet. Christmas, so they'll have no batteries in any of the smoke detectors around. Oh, yeah, for their new toy car and stuff they got for Christmas. Yeah, January's the worst. We write them up all day long. Um, so HUD got sick of the appeals and they realized that it was not, it, it was killing everybody's score and it really wasn't a good true representation of the condition of the property. So HUD said, look, it's still exigent. It's still a 24 hour fix, but we're not going to penalize you for it. Okay. Now the next question is, has the number of units viewed by the REACT inspector increased? No. And it won't until Enspire happens. I've heard rumors we're going to be going into more. If you Google HUD REACT sample size chart, you'll find this. This is from HUD. 
So if you look here, if you have 10, I'm sorry, if you have 10 or 11 units on your property right here, we'll inspect eight. That's 80%. If you have 100 units, that falls in this range, 80 to 101 units, we'll inspect 21. There's a myth going out that we always inspect 20%. It's not. It's not 20%. Like I said, if you have 10 units, we look at eight. That's 80%. So it's literally a range and our cap is 27. So if you have up to 9,999 units, we will only inspect 27 and never anymore. Okay. And that will not change until Inspire happens. And while we're on inspections, the next question says, what is the time frame that REACT is supposed to inform owners and agents of a REACT inspection on the property? Everybody hates that 14-day timeline. So tell us about that. Sure. First of all, if you have a HUD loan or if you're HUD insured, the drop-dead minimum notice that you can get is 15 days. Now, that's drop-dead. That being said, there's something called an IFD ideal future date. And what the servicing mortgages, that's what we call HUD loans, they, they, everybody has an IFD, which is basically the date of your refinance or the last REAC that you had done. So say your REAC last year was October 13th, 2020, and you scored a 70. We'll see you in a year, right? So now your IFD is October 13th, 2021, but with servicing mortgages and insured properties, you have plus or minus 90 days from that IFD to play with. I can schedule it 90 days before the IFD or up to 90 days after, but not past the end of the calendar year. I can't go past December 31st. So if your IFD is December 8th, um, we can schedule it 90 days prior or up to December 31st. That's it. That's our, that's the drop dead. Now, for everybody that's not a HUD loan and not um, insured by HUD, for everybody else, it used to be a 14-day notice. HUD has temporarily increased that to 28 days. On August 10th, they put out a notice that they were going to revert back to the 14 days, but they rescinded that notice on August 30th. So they, and they made it clear that Inspector Notice 2021-01 is still in effect, which is the 28-day notice. And guys, I've heard people, I, I, I've had a few people on LinkedIn tell me, well, the inspector told, he only gave us 14 days. And I said, no, it's been 28 days for quite some time. They're like, well, what are we supposed to do about it? Guys, it's protocol. Tell the inspector, maybe the inspector doesn't know, didn't read their email or I don't know what, but that's against everything. You know, HUD should honestly be catching something like that because they'll see that you only gave the 14 day notice and not the 28. HUD is extremely specific on it. You get 28 days, then at 14 days prior, the inspector has to call you again. Then three days prior, the inspector has to call you again or notify you in some way over and over and over again. So st stick to the protocol. I mean, if it's in writing. You get 28 days, don't bend. Don't okay. bend. Are you able to share with us so that we can post the um, memorandum where they went from, because they were at 14 days, where they went from 14 days to the 28 days? We'll just yeah. Just Stephanie and I, and we'll get it posted. Um, moving right along so we won't keep them too, too long. I have one question about yeah. DCD 4.0. Is that still going to be used with Inspire? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. They're working on a new software um, right now, but they're also talking about having everybody, um, you know, all these contractors are working on software. It's HUD, I, HUD really wants to take a step back. They want to give all the power to the contractors now. They're talking about going back to what's called the big five. Um, where that's what we dubbed them anyway, where the contractors divide up the country and they're responsible for getting the inspections conducted and QA'd and the whole nine yards. Um, HUD just wants to be the cops. They go around and make sure everybody's following the rules. Okay. They don't even really want to give a, a new software for the inspectors to use. And it, they're still talking about it. Everything is still, it's iterative. It's a lot from the demonstrations 
Uh, I know Navigate has a property and we had one of the inspired demonstrations. And the purpose of the demonstration was to help them build a program. So they're still learning a lot and getting a lot of feedback from the demonstrations. Right? And we don't know if they're gonna disseminate that to the inspectors or not. Um, right now they're talking about like I have an IT we have a with constructive forensics my company we have a whole IT department and HUD's HUD is able to give them the parameters of what they need to do on their software so it will sync with their system it, it may be something like that you know where they contract it out individually or you have we have to go get our software buy it from somebody I, we don't know that it's totally up in the air but I can say for sure DCD 4.0 at it's going to be null and void okay. because Inspire is going to revamp. Okay. Two questions. So that with the software, will it be available to commoners for scoring during pre-react in-house inspections? This new software. I don't know if I understand the question. Will it be available to the commoners? So the Inspire, when you go to some of the meetings that they were having about Inspire, they were saying that the owners, managers could buy their own software and put things into the software themselves. So I think that's what they mean. If they do away with that and they bring in some other type of software, will it be open to Joe Blow, John Q Public, whatever have you? Will the managers and owners be able to buy that particular software? Kind of like they do the self MORs, would they be able to buy the software to do their self react inspections? I think that's what they're talking about. I have a software right now with my company that mimics HUD scoring, okay, for the REACT. I do pre-REACTs, and my software that we developed ourselves scores within like 0.001 error rate. It's fantastic. So I can give you a preliminary REACT score. Or during a shadow inspection, we can walk you know, with, with the inspector and, and write down what they write down, and we can give you a score right now instead of you waiting a day or three days or whatever. We can tell you what it was going to be based on what they wrote up. Um, they, HUD did provide a public software uh, for the 2.3 version, which was broken. Okay, I mean, it worked for a little bit, and then there was all kinds of bugs, and they, they didn't want to fix it. And it's still even available on their website. They're like, oh, this is for public download. Yeah, it doesn't work. And it bugs out. It crashes constantly. I've, I've played with it before. I've got two well, more questions I want to get to. Sure. And wait, I'm sorry, Vicki. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had a question about what is the main purpose for placing more emphasis on the condition of residence unit? And then the other one about software, does it have a set of self-driven menus? Oh my gosh, a lot of software questions. Guys, they're not even close to having a working software ready to go. They're, they got a long way to go on that. And specific software questions, long way to go. All right, really. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer what, what hasn't been developed yet. And then as far as what is the main purpose for placing more emphasis, they're talking about Inspire again. Um, why are they gonna put more weight on the units because right now you can fail every single unit and still technically pass the inspection and that's ultimately the antithesis of HUD's goal. HUD's goal is for safe decent sanitary housing but if all the units fail and you still pass what's that say about the REACT process right? So they want to put more emphasis on where the units actually on the, where the tenants actually live okay which makes sense to me I'm very curious as to what the scoring will be and inspire for say erosion or, you know, site tripping hazards, things like that, you know, that are huge points right now. If, if everything they want falls into place, this will be awesome. But HUD needs your feedback. They really, really do. You need to let them know, look, 30 days to fix every single health and safety and 24 hours for all of those critical health and safeties is just not feasible. You know, especially when they, they took all the current efficiencies and labeled them health and safeties for Inspire. So, and I keep saying, oh, you know, we, we decreased, you know, this and no, you didn't, you just took graffiti and made it, which is not a health and safety right now. And you slapped a standard health and safety on it for Inspire. So HUD needs to be aware of all of these concerns. And in fact, um, I've got a webinar coming up 
next week, November 9th, I think it is. It's all about Inspire and what we know so far. It's through Compliance Prime. Um, if you just Google comp CompliancePrime.com, you can attend that uh, that webinar on I'll Inspire. Put that information up on the screen for you right at the end. Um, the other question was um, regarding React egress. Yeah. Can you please clarify the air condition in a window or the window won't stay up, it slides down. Um, what if there is a second mean of egress? Let me take you through egress, okay? Because this is always, it's a, it's a major concern throughout the nation. Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh my gosh. All right, all right, here we go. <laughs> if designed, if designed, there must be a minimum of two independent unobstructed ex exits, one of which must be a door. Doors are always primary egresses. This is for the third floor and lower. For fourth floor and higher, you need to have an unobstructed exit door. And if you have a fire escape, that window has to be accessible to get to that fire escape for fourth floor and higher. If we see this half type lock on any door in the unit except for a mechanical closet or storage shed, it's a blocked primary egress, whether the padlock or zip tie or whatever is present or not. You can't, we don't want to see this on bedroom doors, bathroom doors, closet doors, etc. Okay. Now, the inspector must use their own judgment to determine if the level of effort to open a window constitutes a deficiency. I don't know what it is with putting the worst windows in senior properties, but I'm not kidding. I've almost given myself a hernia trying to lift these windows in some senior places. And if I can't do it, the 85-year-old lady that lives there can't do it either. Okay. So, if it's super hard to open, that could be a blocked egress too. We will take into consideration your resident population. If they have a ton of stuff in front of their window and they're 90 years old and they have to parkour their way to the window, that's blocked because they're, they're not gonna be able to do that, especially if they have a walker or a cane. Now, if you have only one window in a floor area for a room, unit, or building, and it's blocked by that window air conditioner. Whether that AC is secured or not, or there's large furniture, or you have an inoperable window sash, then it's a blocked egress. Now, let me tell you about window egress dimensions by code. The window must open a minimum width of 20 inches. It must open a minimum height of 24 inches, but the clear opening must equal 5.7 net square feet. Okay, so it's not 20 by 24, it's 20 by 41 or 24 by 34. And the windowsill cannot be more than 44 inches from the floor. If it is long, if it is higher than 44 inches, that is not considered an egressible window by the fire department. All right, here's how you do the math. You take 20 times 41, that gives you 820 inches. You divide that by 144 and that gives you 5.7 net square feet. Same thing here, 24 times 34 divide by 144, 5.7 or more, it's an egressible window because I get lots of questions. Well, what if my bed frame comes over about two inches? Measure your opening. This is not something unfortunately that inspectors are taught. What HUD tells the inspectors is, ask yourself two questions. Can a big bulky firefighter with all their gear get into the window quickly? Can a child or elderly person get out quickly? And if the answer is no, it's blocked. You have some inspectors, it could be a half inch of something over that windowsill and they'll mark it blocked. That's when you go to the fire department and you say, hey, this inspector wrote this as a blocked egress, but we've got 5.7 net square feet and I need you to put in writing that it is absolutely egressible still. They will happily do that and fire Trump's HUD 100% of the time. Great. Here's a... Here's a couple more pictures of blocked egress here. Here, here's your window AC, whether you have it secured or not. We like the floor ACs to answer your question even better. Here you have this vent connector, right? Do not tape this in. If it takes me 20 minutes to pull all that tape off, I'm, I'm burned, I'm dead, okay? So what I usually tell people is get one of those sticky foam door seals and line the window. And when you shut the window onto the vent connector, you're gonna get rid of that gap, the air gap, okay? And um, 
you don't want to tape this area either. You want to maybe just stuff some foam in. And then if you're worried about security, you put in a stick, you put in a thumb lock, whatever. During the REAC inspection, we're going to pull out this foam bit that's here that's not taped in. We're going to open the window, pull the vent connector out, shut the window, test to make sure the lock works, and then put it all back together. Nice and easy. Okay. One last question. And yes. then we're going to turn it over to you so they all know how to get in touch with you. Um, it asks, good morning, what is a common issue that owner and agents overlook when preparing for a REAC? So you can give us maybe about three common things that people forget when they're having their REAC. That's tough because there's just so many. <laughs> um, make sure none of your sprinkler heads have any paint on them, not even a speck on the whole head, on the arms, on the spreader, on the valve, on the sensor in the middle, no paint. You can have paint on the escutcheon. That's that ring that goes around the sprinkler head, but not on the head itself. Make sure that the skirt is there if you have a skirt and an escutcheon for the sprinkler head. Um, another thing people miss, go to your water heater room on the day of inspection before the inspector gets there and look for leaks and look at the floor in order to do that. You don't look at the piping, you look at the floor. That's the first thing I do is I look for any spots and then I'll follow that spot up to the pipe and I'll find the leak. Um, something else on the day of inspection, gosh, you know, Murphy's Law, what will break? Usually breaks on the day of inspection. I just checked that 15 times. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I could have been retired by now. <laughs> So it's, it's really hard, but I do want to say we're working on a React prep guide. It's short, it's sweet, it's high scoring items that are fixed, fixed quickly and easily. We're putting the final touches on it now. And in fact, I'm going to make it my October newsletter. They posted it in chat and I have it on this last screen. Oh boy, I, I had a lot more on blocked egress. Oh, I heard that. Yeah, sorry guys. Yeah. Come back. Yes. All right, here is my website to sign up for my newsletter, to be on my newsletter list. It's only once a month. You'll get an email with my newsletter. It's anything latest breaking news from HUD, or I pick a deficiency of the month to talk about. So this month is, it's going to be about the YouTube channel um, with this uh, webinar that we just did. And it's also going to be my React Quick Prep Guide, two pages, short and sweet, things to look out for to prepare for your React inspection. And someone was asking if you were going to share your slides. Can't do the copyright um, stuff, but I have webinars all the time. And if you're on my newsletter list, you'll find out when my next one, I think our next one's going to be first quarter of next year. I have a whole series. Uh, it's, there's so much information, guys, and you really need constant um, access to this information to really be able to retain it. And my webinars are, they're an hour and a half long, or you can do a two full day. I, trust me, I could talk about this for two full days. Straight. I, see I, see <laughs> I do, because I really firmly believe the more you know, the better you'll do, the less you'll see React inspectors and the happier re your residents are going to be. You know, but, uh, you can get a lot of information through her newsletter. I have just signed up myself. Uh, you can get a lot of information through her newsletter. And Kathy is the type of person, because she is passionate about this, if you do have a question, she'll take a question from you. Don't send her thousands of questions. Just ask her to help you with one or two. Um, so with that being said, I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for coming. Kathy, thank you so much. You have been great. And if you have any additional questions, if you'll email them to me, I will try to get answers from Kathy for you. For you. Don't bombard her, though, in her email. Just send them Oh, no, no, no. Bombard me. No, bombard me. Seriously. I, I, okay. Right. I, I love this stuff. That's what I live for. Great, great. Well, thank you, guys. And we will see you again next on the fourth Tuesday of November for another Tuesday Tip Live. Meanwhile, we'll have our weekly Tuesday Tips. And again, just help me thank our guest, Kathy. She was just, just tremendous. We just love her. Thank you Great so job. much. Thank you. All right. Sorry to keep y'all so long, but it was worth it. <laughs> and thank you for subscribing. I saw somebody just did. Oh, and this blog, you'll be able to scroll through and see all the previous versions you missed about fire extinguishers, sprinklers. I have it all. It's all up there. Okay.
Thank you. Welcome. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, Ebony. Thank you.